We get it. Making new relationships and strengthening existing ones is not always easy. Sometimes we wonder if we are establishing good friendships in our lives, or even if we're a friend others would want to have in their life. We long for people with which we can share the moments of joy, spend our day with, confide in. We crave authenticity and depth with one another. But how do we even get there? The good news is, the Bible has answers for improving our relationships and being the kind of friend others deserve. We need this because we're better together. Well, good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you're here. So grateful that you are part of this service. And many of you are online. And some of you, today, this is the first time you have joined us at Sugar Creek Baptist Church online. And we're so grateful that you have. I don't know how you found us, but I am so glad you did. And I hope that you'll give us the opportunity to spend a little time with you. And I'm asking you if you'll hang on a little bit and go all the way to the end of the service. And the reason is this. At the end of the service, there is an opportunity to, do, uh, to go to a Next Step Center. It's virtual, Next Step Center. But it gives you a chance to talk to one of our ministers if you choose to do that, or one of our volunteers, and find out more about who Sugar Creek is and, and give us a chance to get to know you a little bit better. And I want to encourage you to do that if you will. And for everyone who is now joining this service on in person on all four of our campuses, I welcome each and every one of you. You took the effort, you came, and I am really, really grateful. Last week, our three regional campuses all had a very special Sunday. We, it, it was fam fest and we had a great time together. And I'm going to tell you, we had almost, it was just under 3,500 people in person. And it was an all time high since this COVID thing has come. And it means that we have reached 76% of our pre COVID average attendance. And it's great. All that means is more and more and more people are coming back. And we are so grateful for it. And I'm going to tell you this, last Sunday, we had more guests, more new families than I've ever seen before, more guests that came last Sunday. It was absolutely amazing how many people were visiting us for the very first time last Sunday morning. And I am really grateful. And I hope you're back today. Uh, welcome to each and every one of you. Last Sunday morning, we began a new series simply entitled Friends. We're better together. And I'm telling you, this series is really critical right now because of 18 months, 19 months already of this whole pandemic loneliness that's going on across our country. There is a deep abiding loneliness that is setting in in our country. People are saying that everywhere. But there is more to the series than just trying to overcome the last 19 months. By the way, we're moving toward two years of COVID and the ramifications of it are going to be with us for a while. But there is more than that that is about the series. I came to know about a, a major study that was done on the whole issue of loneliness in the country that is not about COVID. It's just about what's happening in America. And the end result of the study was basically this. First of all, that the millennial generation is much lonelier than the generation that came before it. That was generation X, by the way. Now, millennials are, I mean, this isn't exact, but you know, give me a little grace here. It's basically 20s and 30s basically 20s and 30s, and that generation, the study showed, is far lonelier as a generation than the generation before it, Generation X. And Generation X is basically, just give me a little grace here, 40s and 50s. And what they discovered is Generation X is lonelier than the generation before it, which is the baby boomers. The baby boomers are generally, they are like 60s to 150. I don't know really where it ends, but it is just there. So here is the pattern. Are you seeing this pattern? 
The generation after the boomers is lonelier. The generation after that generation is lonelier. So what do you think about now the new generation that is teenagers and below and where they are and what is happening in that generation? And you know what they discovered? And we're not surprised by this at all. We're not at all surprised. The reason that this has happened is because of social media and video games. Are we surprised? No, we're not a bit surprised. Social media's goal was to sort of bring us together to, to, to help with social relationships. And it's been successful in some regards. But the problem that has happened that's emerged that we didn't see, but it is emerging over time is that the relationships are so much more shallow. They don't go deeper, they don't go deep enough and we're missing out on a key component of life because of social media and because of video games. So here's what I'm gonna say to all you parents and grandparents, I'm gonna say, yay God for you, you have understood this, you have put up boundaries for your kids and you have said, okay, yes, we'll let you on social media or what, uh, on video games, yes, we'll let you do that, but you have limitations. Because the other time of your life, you need to be building relationships and friendships and hanging out because nothing, deepens relationships like just hanging out with other people and you understand that and yay God for parents and grandparents who understand it. And by the way, that is not just limitations we put on kids, it's limitations we put on us. Because the whole time people are doing all those game, video games and stuff, we're not having relationships with other people. And we've got to grab a hold of this issue in our life too. And I already know that you're doing it. We began a new series last week, simply entitled Friends. And the first message in the series was, how do we have a friend with God? A friendship with God. And it's very possible. We talked about how to do that, how to have a friendship with God. Now, this morning, we, begin, we continue the series, but the rest of the series is all about humans. How do we have a friendship with other human beings? It's a whole lot more complicated with humans. And so how do we build, how do we start relationships? How do we grow relationships? How do we deepen our relationships with other people in our life? And I think the first step that we're gonna look at today is gonna be a surprise for people. Maybe not for everybody, but I think it's gonna be a surprise because what I wanna talk to you about today is the first step has gotta be internal with you. I know you already have relationships. I'm gonna tell you, if you wanna grow those relationships and deepen them and build new relationships, something has to happen inside of you. There is part of your past that needs to be resolved. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today, cleaning the slate. There's a passage of scripture in Philippians chapter three, verse 13 and 14. And listen to what he says. This is the apostle Paul talking. And here's what he says. I don't consider myself yet having taken hold of it. What is it? He's really in the context of the past. He's talking about this deep abiding, growing, maturing relationship with God. And he says, I know I have this relationship with God, but I haven't reached all the way of where that relation's going, relationship's going to go. I haven't arrived yet, but this one thing I know, I've got to forget what is behind. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, this passage is so deep and we're not gonna unpack this passage this morning. There's one phrase I want us to grab hold of and it's simply this, forgetting what is behind. Forgetting what is behind. This is so key. Paul knew it. He says, I can't go any further until I forget. I let go of my past. What past? If you go back in the passage before this, he did some awful stuff, terrible stuff. He did a lot worse stuff than you've ever done. And he's confessed that in that passage. And he has said, but I got to walk away from that. Forgetting my past. I've got to walk forward in my future. And I'm going to tell you this needs to happen in our lives as well. And I want to talk to you about that very thing. Fixing the present 
requires letting go of the past. It is so important to do it. All of us in this room have emotional baggage. All of us do. All of us in this room have emotional baggage that we are lugging around with us that are affecting our relationships in our life. Now by uh, uh, emotional baggage, what am I talking about? Well, all of us have struggles with resentments. All of us have individuals, they said things to us, they did things to us, they wrote things about us, they were so mean, they gossiped about us, and we found out, and all of us struggle with all of this issue of, re, of relationships and resentment. It was Nelson Mandela who wrote, resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. Well, it won't. It's going to kill you and you know, and that's what he's talking to. He's, he nailed it right on about resentment. Second of all, we're all struggling with some regrets in our life. All of us have done things that we now look back on and we're embarrassed by. We're ashamed of how in the world could we do it? There are times in which we feel we are so free and I'll do what I please and blah, blah, blah. And after we get through with all the expressions that we look back and we, I can't believe I've done this. I cannot believe that that has come out of my life. And all of us struggle with this emotional baggage of remembering the things that we did, the attitudes we had, and the things we've said, and it is regrets. And then all of us struggle with tragedy and hurt. And it might be that some of you say, no, I'm, I haven't had any tragedy. Yay, God, for that. Every day, you wake up and you have not had tragedy or hurt. Every day, thank God. Because it's coming, thank God it hadn't come yet. It's coming, it's a part of life, it's what life is about. And all of this stuff we carry around with us and there is a need for us to deal with it. Three things we need to be released from and that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. And the first one is simply this, let go of your grudges. I want to use an illustration I've used before. I, I, I think it is just perfect for this moment. So you might recognize it for those of you who've been here a long time. It is about a woman who was at the airport. She went to the airport. She's going to catch a flight and she went early. She was there about an hour before departure and she had everything together. And so she decided, I'm here a little bit early. I'm gonna to go to the snack shop. I love going to the snack shop. I don't like the prices at the snack shop at the airport, but snack shops, I love them. And I've got this sugar thing that I enjoy. Well, she went to the, went to the snack shop and she got a package of cookies. Now in those packages of cookies, there are five cookies and she bought the package of cookies and then she went and sat down at a table that was just out there and she was looking at her cell phone and texting people and all that kind of thing and all of a sudden she heard the rustling of something she looked up and a man total stranger has joined her at the table it's probable that all the tables have been taken just looking for a chair okay i'll sit here she won't mind and he doesn't bother her she doesn't bother him and he but he is opening the package of cookies and she hears the rustling of the opening of the package of the cookies. And she watches him. She cannot believe her eyes. He takes one of the cookies out, pops it in his mouth, and looks down at his phone and keeps on going. She just thinks to herself, I cannot believe this is happening. Now, she could have confronted him, but she dare not. Because we all know that airports are full of crazy people. And you got to be very careful in airports if you're a woman by yourself, especially. No, she said, I'm not going to confront him. But she just reached over the table, grabbed hold of the package of cookies, brought them beside herself, took one of the cookies and just kept on on her cell phone. And before long, she heard the rustling of the package again. <gasps> he reached over, got the package. He took the third cookie. This is the moment to confront him. 
but she does not dare do it. She just thinks to herself, I cannot believe this, but I don't want to. Seen in the airport, I will end up being on TV somewhere. I'm not going to have a scene in the airport. So all she does is reach over, grab the package of cookies, brings it back to herself, takes the fourth cookie and goes back to her cell phone. It wasn't long. You know what's going to happen. All of a sudden, she hears the rustling, and here's what she sees. This guy has stood up. He has now taken the fifth cookie. He breaks it in half. He puts half back in the package for her. He pops the the other half in his mouth. He picks up all of his luggage, and off he goes. And this woman is sitting there, and she is thinking to herself, men, men, They are such bullies. They just think that they can go around total strangers, do whatever they please. Then she heard on the intercom that her flight is boarding. So she opened up her purse to get her boarding pass and there was the unopened package of cookies. inside her purse. He was not stealing hers. She was stealing his. And somewhere in the airport, there is a man thinking, women. They think they own everything. And all I'm trying to say is, life is so full of opportunities to offend and be offended. We're encountering human beings. We're encountering other people. And we will find times in which we are encountering another person. They wound us. They say something. They have an attitude. How dare you? Or we do the same thing and we're not even realizing we're doing it. So what are we to do? Ephesians chapter four, verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate toward one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Bitterness is giving someone else control over your life. Every time you say, You make me so mad, you're admitting that you have given up control of your life. See, no one can make you mad unless you give them power. And what you need to do is take back the power over your life. So how do you do it? Job chapter five, verse two says, to worry about yourself, to worry yourself to death with resentment would be a foolish and senseless thing to do. Let your past be past and go on. Let go of your grudges. So how do you let go of your grudges? Well, look at that verse that we saw, we just read in Ephesians chapter four. He tells us first, choose to stop the resentment. Let all bitterness be put away from you. Get rid of all bitterness. He didn't say stop feeling bitter. That's not what he said. He said stop being bitter. Coming to the other side of bitterness is a decision we make, not a feeling we have. See, if you're waiting for the feeling, see, I just want to be honest with myself and so I won't do anything until I feel it. If you're waiting for the feeling, you may be waiting the rest of your life because if your feelings are in control of you, I feel so sorry for you because your life's going to be a mess. Our feelings control us in the wrong direction and this is where we need a brain and our spirit, the spirit of God in our heart giving us direction. And we let our feelings eventually catch up with us, but we do not let them lead us. They will always lead us in the wrong way. We cannot, should not feel our way into doing. We have to do our way into feeling. It's the only way that a person can take control. Letting go of past offense is an act of your will, 
not an act of your feel. Choose to stop the resentment. Here is the thing. You see, sometimes, okay, God, I make the choice to, for, to forgive. And you say, I did that. And I still, I still feel it. So here's what you do. Here's sometimes what happens. Our, the wound that we have is so deep that forgiveness is not an event. It's a process. So here is what I recommend to you. What you got to do in the morning is when you begin your day and you think of that offense, you say, God, I choose to forgive so-and-so. I choose to forgive that person. And then when it comes back to you about noon or a couple hours later, God, I choose to forgive so-and-so. In the afternoon, God, I choose to forgive so-and-so. In the evening, I choose to forgive so-and-so. The next morning, I choose to forgive so-and-so. And what you're thinking is, I'm not getting anywhere with this, but actually you are. What you are doing is laying down layers of forgiveness and don't stop doing it, just keep doing it. Because one day you're gonna wake up and you no longer you no longer feel it. You no longer have it. You have laid down enough layers that you, your feelings finally caught up with your decision. Here's the second thing. Choose to be kind to others even when you don't want to be. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other. By the way, this is a command, not a recommendation in the Bible. He's commanding. It means that you give a soft word when really you want to tell them off. It means you do something kind for someone when you really want to smack them. So yesterday I'm preparing what I'm going to be saying to you today and I'm thinking it all, thinking it all out and suddenly God brings a story to my mind. And I, it was a revelation. I really, I have people offend me. I have people say things, do things. I just think, come on. And I have encounters just like you do. I'm a real live person, very alive person. And I have the same struggles and I do well. Oftentimes I do. I, I've really disciplined myself with this whole resentment thing and forgiveness thing. But there are some times that I have a bigger struggle than others. So let me tell you a story of a bigger struggle. I don't know how long now it's been. I'm thinking it's been a decade, maybe longer than a decade. And uh, there was a, a guy, at it, by the way, nobody in the church. This person has never been a part of this church and never lived here. He lives a long way off. He and I met each other, became friends, at least I thought we were. And he's, he's a business guy and a vendor. And he was offering something that I thought would be a benefit in our church. So I negotiated a deal with him and we had a deal. And then all of a sudden, right at the end, he switched it and he gave us less. And he never told me until it had been done. And I couldn't believe it. I called him up. Something, some mistake has happened here. Oh no. Well, uh, you know, and then he, him and Hawes and then he, oh, I'm so sorry, but you know, we go on. Now, you know what? I'm the guy of second chances. I just really believe in them. I believe you got to believe in people. And so I decided I, uh, a little bit later came, I, I gave him second chances. And so I, it, I, made another deal with him. I'd negotiated the deal and right before he did exactly the same thing to me. He delivered something but it wasn't what we said. And I, I got to tell you, I was upset. I was upset partly because I told others, you know, this, here's what was happening. And then it didn't. And I felt cheated. I felt humiliated. And I thought, you know, first time that's on him. The second time that's on me. And I want to just tell you, I couldn't shake it. I didn't shake it. I could have shaken it. I didn't shake it. So a little bit of time went by. And um, his wife got cancer. And I found out about the fact she had cancer. And I felt like God said to me that I needed to send him and his wife flowers 
from Kathy and I and the gift basket. I thought the gift basket was way over the top. I could only make flowers maybe, gift basket. I didn't want to do it. I'm just being honest with you. I didn't want to do it, but I did it. Sent him flowers, but I had a little card. Kathy and I are praying for you guys, and we didn't, genuinely did, and I, but I didn't want to do it. I didn't send any dynamite in the flowers at all. <laughs> and he sent me back, uh, man, this means the world to me. You'd be thinking about us at a time like this. Thank you so much. And, but you know what? It dawned on me yesterday as I was thinking about it. I haven't thought about it since. And you know what I realized? The act of kindness healed me. My act of kindness toward him that he didn't deserve healed me of the resentment I felt. Isn't God so smart? And so he is saying, choose to stop the resentment, choose to be kind to others when they don't deserve it. And the third is choose to be tenderhearted. This is the hardest one. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And God is saying, if you will take these truths, these principles in your life and do them, you don't feel them. You don't have to feel them. You don't feel them, but you do them in obedience. If you do them, he'll give you grace to overcome, you gotta get on the other side of your grudges. Second of all, allow God to heal your grief. Sorrow is a normal part of life. Everybody eventually suffers loss. And maybe it's the loss of money or the loss of a job. And they did you wrong. Or it's a loss of a friend who just walks out on you or the loss of someone you deeply love and they die. It's part of life. Can somebody just say, honest, sometimes life stinks. It's a part of life. There is nothing wrong with mourning because you're not a robot. You're a person, but there's a way to mourn. So there's a verse in the Bible that talks about mourning for a person that has died, but it applies the same principle to every kind of mourning in our life. So listen to what it says, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. He means about someone who has died. So that you will not grieve as, and the key word is as, circle the word as, it's the, it's the pivot. That you will not grieve. He's not saying don't grieve. You can grieve, but don't grieve as. Don't grieve as the rest of people who have no hope. Because you're filled with hope. The message version is not a translation. It's a paraphrase. It's somebody sitting there and saying, well, what this verse means to me. So don't take the the message as a translation. It's not. But the message version says it this way. First off, you must not carry on over them. Like, there's the word, as and like. Like people who have nothing to look forward to, as if the grave were the last word, because the grave is not the last word. He's not saying don't grieve. He already knows we're gonna grieve. Of course we're gonna grieve, but don't grieve as though people grieve who don't have any hope, don't know God, don't have anything. Don't do that because you have so much more One day you're going to see that person knows Jesus as Savior and you know Jesus as Savior. One day you're going to see that person again. I don't know how many, I don't know when, but one day you're going to hug that person again. One day you're going to kiss that person again. One day you are going to be there and smile that person again. But here is the greater good news. That person, when you see that person again, will be perfect 
and you will be perfect and it will even be greater than you can ever imagine because you've been perfected, sanctified in Christ the next time you see that person. Many of you, most of you, maybe none of you will remember this guy, it, I don't know how many years, 10 years or so ago, Obi Hokinson was a member of our church and Obi passed away. He was an older guy and I liked Obi. I just thought he was such a good guy. And it was the day, I think, right before Thanksgiving, I felt badly that he was gonna be alone and up there in the hospital and he was dying of cancer. So I went up and spent about an hour or so with Obi and we just sat and talked. And, and uh, so I walked in the room and my first question was to Obi, uh, so what's going on? What's happening? And he said, I'm dying. That's what's happening. But that sounded very much like Obi. Just went right to the, I'm dying. That's what's happening. So uh, my second question was, how do you feel about that? And that would sound like a dumb question to ask, but I already knew him. And I said, how do you feel about that? He said, I'm thrilled. I am so thrilled. And I asked him why. And he said, uh, it's been too long. I've been separated from my wife for way too long. And I'm really lonely for her. I really want to see her again. And second of all, I love Jesus so much. And I, I'm finally, 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 it's my turn. I'm gonna to get to see Jesus. I'm gonna to get to hug him. I'm gonna to get to look in his face. He said, I'm thrilled to death. Now, I don't know that he said thrilled to death, but <laughs> it's to that effect. So the conversation lasted over an hour. So here's, and I'm cutting it short. So I said to him, Obi, what do you think dying is gonna be like? And here's what he said. I am not exaggerating. Here's what he said. He said, it's going to be like flying to St. Louis. Because he was from St. Louis. That's no knock on St. Louis, by the way. Oh boy, I gotta go to St. Louis. That's like dying. No, that's not what he was saying. He was saying the opposite. He was from St. Louis and he was saying it's like flying home. It's like flying home. You think about when you fly somewhere where you got people waiting for you, you're anticipating, anticipating the day, you got everything ready, the day's come. Now you go, get in the car, go to the airport, and the, you finally get on the airport, on the airplane, and you're going, and, the, and you're thinking, they're going to be there at the airport. They're going to be meeting me. And you get so excited that you're going to get to finally see them again. That's what he said dying's going to be like. here's what I want to say to you. When we've suffered loss and we're mourning and the loss of money, the loss of a job, the loss of a friend, the loss of a loved one that has died, you can't stop living. You must not stop living. So what do you do? When we go through deep grief, grief, three things have got to happen. First, we've got to accept what we cannot change. You can't change the fact the money's gone. You can't change what's happened to your job. You gotta accept what you cannot change. You gotta come to acceptance. Number two, you gotta balance your pain with your hope. It, not all is lost. You gotta balance your pain with what the truth is if what is happening in your life and what is coming for your life. And part of that means you are willing to have new goals. The only thing that has ever gotten you out of bed in the morning has been goals. I don't know what your goals are, but you got goals. And whether you know it consciously or subconsciously, goals are what have gotten you up out of that bed every single time. That's why you don't lay in bed all day. You get up, you get after things, you've got goals to accomplish. And when you suffer loss, sometimes you suffer some of the goals that mean a lot to you. And you got to work that out and you got to come up with a list of new goals if that's what you've got to do so that those goals get you up and get you going. And now you have renewed purpose. You got to do that that. You got to put together goals. And third, you got to be willing to focus on what remains because there is that which remains. And you can't forget which remains because you are harboring everything or putting everything on what has been lost. Now, 
very quickly the third point since I'm way out too late. Shed your guilt is the third principle, shed your guilt. And I'm gonna cut this kind of short, but here's what I wanna say to you. One of the big shockers that I've had in the ministry One of the things I never saw coming ever, but it has been everywhere I've ever gone in the ministry, that there are some people who do not want to be forgiven. They don't want God to forgive them. They have done some awful thing and they don't wanna be forgiven. What they wanna do is they wanna beat themselves up every single day. They just wanna whip themselves back and forth every single day. I don't wanna be forgiven. I am going to show how noble I am by keep beating myself up and I won't even forgive myself. You're not being noble. You're stealing life from you. You're stealing this moment of life from you and you're not just doing it to you. You're actually spilling over into your relationships and you don't even know it and they don't know what's going on with you either. But you are actually hurting your relationships. I don't know why you're doing it. They don't, know, they don't understand what's going on in your whole mental process, but you are refusing somehow to not be forgiven because you think it's somehow noble for you to keep beating yourself up. No, you're hurting yourself and you're hurting other people around you. You're not being noble. You need to come to this place of forgiveness and it includes forgiving yourself. So what do we do? To clean up our past and begin again, we must openly confess our faults to God. Confession is so important. Listen to what he says. If we confess, there it is, our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It begins with confession and you gotta do this. You gotta come to this. Come to the place of confession. Why? Because confession is a part of healing. Confession is very, very important. You gotta come to this place in order to release your guilt. Let me tell you what guilt's doing in your life. Guilt is destroying your confidence. And here's what I mean. You're about to do something and you, you're talking to yourself and you're telling yourself how bad you are. You're telling yourself how hopeless you are. You're actually killing your own confidence that you, sh- you would have far more confidence in your life if you'd let yourself be forgiven and you would forgive yourself. You need that confidence back in your life. It destroys confidence. It destroys other relationships, damages your relationships. And you don't even know you're damaging other relationships. But the way you're acting and behaving is causing damage to other relationships and it's guilt. And third of all, it keeps you stuck in the past. All you can think about is what you did. You need to come to a place of forgiveness. So you gotta come to to confess your sins. And part of what that means is to remove guilt. First, you've got to take a personal moral inventory. You got to take a personal moral inventory. However it is, you make a list electronically on paper, whatever you do, you've got to, you've got to begin to, to make a list of all your sins. I got to tell you, it might take you two days to list all your sins. You got to be willing to do it. Give it time. God, I'm gonna ask the Holy Spirit to bring back to my mind all my sins. Why would I wanna do that? You wanna get rid of them. I give you the freedom to just bring back all my sins and give yourself time. And you've got this piece of paper you hide from everybody else in your life and you just add, you just, he brings it back to you. You could make the list, make the list. Lamentations chapter three, verse 40, let us examine our ways and test them. This is, this is what's got to happen. Second of all, you've got to accept responsibility for your own faults. Don't wimp out. Don't be a wimp. Oh, well, that, that's not actually my fault. That's the fault of my husband. That is the fault of my wife. That is the fault of my kids. That is the fault of my parents. That's the fault of my boss. No, don't wimp out. List it, take ownership over what you did. Nobody made you do anything. Proverbs 20, verse 27 says, the Lord gave us a mind and a conscience and we can't hide from ourselves. Number three, ask God for forgiveness. 
If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Would you see that? He's faithful and just to forgive us. And what else? Cleanse us. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Number four, admit your fault towards someone that you've offended and now go and ask for forgiveness. You got it right with God. Go and ask for forgiveness. Here's the last one. Accept God's forgiveness and forgive yourself. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. But now notice Psalm 32. What happiness for those whose guilt has been forgiven. What relief for those who have confessed their sins. And God has cleared their record. Let this be who you are. Get rid of that past garbage and be set free. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. You do so many wonderful things in our life. And now, Father, move in our hearts that we would do what you've told us to do. Spend this whole week going to work on what you are doing inside of us to bring freedom and liberality to our lives so that we might have relationships with other people that is clean and free. Help us, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.